Uh, where did they go? I'm gonna find them. When I find them, I'm gonna squash them to pieces, and I'm gonna knock their heads off and cut them off and throw them in the dungeons of despair. Finny! Elijah! Where are you? That that's fine. I don't care about that. That's my great 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 grandmother's face. Um, I'm here to talk about who took Anakin Skywalker from my Luke Skywalker set, my Lego set. I know it was one of you. And wait a second, what was Finny gonna say? Anakin Skywalker! <sighs> what are we doing here fighting about? I thought we were going to do fanatical conversations with whatever that was. Uh, I don't have time for that. Let's just get on with the story. Hit the music! Chapter 9 Secret Cruiser. Joe's pulse quickened when he heard of this promising new lead. We'll be right over to you, Mr. Flimmer, he exclaimed. Hanging up, he told Frank of what the gem shop puppeteer had said. Maybe we're on to something, Frank agreed. Aunt Gertrude paused in the midst of trimming a pie crust as they rushed out through the kitchen door. Lamb sakes, where are you boys off to? she scolded. Don't you realize you ruined your digestions? On your cooking? Why, Auntie? Joe grinned and ducked under out before she could retort. The boys hopped into their convertible and drove to the shop on Bay Street. Although Mr. Flimmer again seemed somewhat nervous, obviously had no desire to be called involved in a criminal case, he seemed eager to be helpful. This man who brought the stones had have you ever seen him before? Frank inquired. No, and he gave no name. Mr. Flemmer replied. The amethysts were uncut stones, quite large. Genuine? Oh, yes, indeed. Did you ask him where he got them? Joe put in. Well, I, I tried to find out where they came from, and he was very impatient. And he wouldn't leave the stones for cutting or polishing, although I offered to do it very reasonably. What did this fellow look like? Frank asked. 
Oh, he was uh, he was big and husky. The puppeteers, Adam's apple, Bob Dale's, he thought, as if he thought it made him uneasy. And he was dressed rather sportily. His hair was bushy, and he had a plaid sports coat. Frank darted a surprised glance at Joe. The description clicked. Sounds like Duke Martin, Joe muttered. Hoping for a further lead, he asked Mr. Flimmer, Did you see what kind of car he was driving? Oh, oh I, don't, I don't think he came in a car, the property of Tier replied. Although, some of me have dropped him off, I suppose. But I, I watched when he left. I saw him get into a taxi at that stand across the street. How long ago was that? I'd say about half an hour. Thanks, Mr. Flimmer. You've been a great help. Eh, don't mention it, boys. Frank and Joe hurried across the street. A taxi driver slouched in his taxi, reading a newspaper. The boy described Mackett to him, and they asked the man if he had seen the cabin driver and driven off with him. Oh, uh, yeah, that was Mike, I think. Should, have, should be back here any soon, unless he picked up another fare. The Hardys returned to their convertible to wait. They fidgeted impatiently for as twenty minutes went by. At last, at last, another taxi pulled into the stand. The first driver looked up from his paper and gave the boys a two-fingered whistle, and jerked his thumb toward the other taxi. Frank and Joe strode across the street and questioned the man who had just arrived. Oh yeah, sure I know the man you mean, he told them. I took him out to the little picnic ground on Shore Road. Picnic ground? Joe echoed in surprise. Yeah, it did seem kind of like a funny place for him to get out, the driver said. I figured he probably planned to meet someone there. At Frank's request, the driver described the spot and sketched a map. Frank tipped him, and the boys hurried back to their own car. Let's take a look at that spot right now, Joseph proposed. We might be able to pick up a clue. Right. Frank took the wheel, and soon their convertible was rolling down Shore Road. In a few minutes, they came to the spot that the driver had described, a small clearing laid out for the picnickers. A family was eating at one of the tables. Otherwise, the site was deserted. The Hardys got out to look around. Beyond the clearing, the ground was wooded and sloped steeply down to the shore of Barman Bay. I wonder what Malcolm was doing around here, Joe asked. He must have some kind of reason, Frank said. Maybe we can find it. The two boys were wandering around the fridges of the picnic area, peering among the trees and shrubbery. Suddenly, Joe gasped and pointed to the water. Look, Frank! Far below, about a hundred yards to sea seaward from the point of the bay at which they were standing, the shore was intended by a reedy, reedy inlet. A cabin cruiser lay anchored close to the shore. Oh, well, I bet that's the answer, all right, Frank agreed. Maybe it's the same cruiser that Fogman came from. The Cardi scrambled along the brow of the slope until they were overlooking the at inlet. Even here, the cruiser was not completely visible. Its hull was screened by heavy clumps of reed and brushes, and the boy's view was further blocked by a thick growth crest in the slope. Ah, sure, it's a good place to hide, Joe muttered. Let's get down closer. The boys began picking their way cautiously down the steep high side, hillside, but as the trees and brush thinned out, they, they themselves were exposed to view as they moved close to the cruiser. Suddenly Lisa saw a man emerge from the cabin and cock one arm. Look out, Frank cried out. There may be a bomb he's throwing. The boys flattened themselves in the underbrush as the object spun through the air. A gas grenade, Joe railed to his brother. The boys sprang to their feet and hurried back up the slope as the throb of the boat engine reached their ears. In a second, the hillside was flowing with billing purple smoke. Gasping and choking, and with tears streaming from their eyes, Frank and Joe finally reached the top of the hill and ran toward the picnic ground. The family at the table stared at them in wide-eyed excitement. What's going on? The man shouted. Some prankster in a boat there shone through a tear gas grenade. <laughs> it, so as not to... Frank said, so as not to alarm the group. Why, that's terrible. Someone should call the police, the man's wife said. Oh, we'll report it. <laughs> <laughs> Frank promised. Fortunately, an offshore breeze was blowing the smoke away from the picnic ground and out onto the bay, but the smoke screen hid the cruiser completely from the view. The Hardys hurried to their car and warmed up the short wave, wave set. Frank contacted the Coast Guard station. The radio operator on duty promised that an effort would be made to spot the cabin cruiser. There seemed little hope out of identifying it, though. 
However, among all of the other groups in the bay, especially since the boys had not noticed no special features, not even among the cruiser's name, Frank and Joe were glum as they drove home. Do you suppose Malcolm was aboard? Joe asked. I don't know. The inland was a practically a swamp. It, it sure didn't look like an easy place to get on or off the cruiser, but the purple smoke was the same kind he ran into the other night. That would seem to link the cruiser itself to Stray. Joe glanced at his brother. Incidentally, why didn't you ask Mr. Flummer if those amethysts were genuine? M Mackin's a confidence man, plus his other rackets, remember? I thought he might be able to planning to use those stones for some con game. Hmm. As soon as the Hardy's boys got home, Frank placed a call to the Western State University. He explained that he wanted information about the former professor named Adam Darrow. What can I do with Dean Carabs? The switch reporter replied. Frank identified himself to the Dean. Uh, uh, yes, thanks. Uh, I've often heard of your father. What can I do for you? Frank explained that Darrow's name had come up in, a, in connection with the case that the Hardys were investigating. He asked if the Dean could tell him anything about Darrow's background. Well, up until last term, Professor Darrow taught a special course in prime detection methods here, Dean Gibbs replied. He has a background in both physical and organic chemistry. Before he joined our facility, he worked on police crimes labs in several western cities. Why did he leave the university? Well, that was rather unfortunate, Gibbs said. You see, he had been trying to raise funds for a research on a project he claimed would be of great value to the police. What sort of project? Uh, to be honest, we, we don't really know about it. Mr. Darrow became very secretive and suspicious. In fact, we felt he was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. After the school refused to allot any more money for his project, Darrow became extremely upset and resigned. I see. We were told that he recently bought a house here in Bayport. Did he say what his plans were when he left the university? No, not a word. In fact, when we had no idea of the present whereabouts before you called, Frank was just hanging up on a plane roared over to the house. The boys could hear a turn and zoom as if it was buzzing for the Hardy's residence. That might be the, the Jack Wayne, Joe exclaimed. He rushed out the, uh, the window. It's Sky Happy Seal, all right. Maybe Jack wants to talk to us. The boys dashed downstairs and switched on the two-way radio. Joe took the microphone. Hardy's to sail. Can you hear us? The boys, the pilot's voice crackled over the speaker. Loud and clear, Joe. Listen, I think I picked up a hot lead from Harith. It may tie in with those jewel robberies in your dead ends. Jack's voice was drowned out by a sudden burst of static. When it came through again, it was so faint that Bart the hardest could only catch a few words. It's the tiger's bite. Empties. There was some, another burst of static, and the radio message died out completely. What happened to Jack? I guess there's only one way to find out. Stay for chapter 10 coming up.